meaning there are not a lot of people above a certain income class, the majority of people are really hovering uh, below the poverty level or maybe 10 or 20 points above the poverty level. So that is a really clear common denominator. Okay, my second one. When you were working in Detroit, was bankruptcy imminent? Uh, it was definitely on the table when I first got there in 2009, 2010. I mean, insiders knew that there was a severe fiscal crisis. Uh, they were obviously very hopeful that that administration could solve it without both first the step of the emergency management. The question was, was, was bankruptcy imminent? Um, uh, the administration firmly believed that going to an emergency manager was a last ditch effort and certainly bankruptcy was as well. And so the last three years have basically been spent trying to solve the problem themselves. Um, and it wasn't until the media started reporting more of the details of the fiscal challenge and the planning process, quite frankly, began to reveal some of the ways with which it was becoming more expensive for the region's poorest people to live in the city. It just became really clear that this sort of way of operating was unsustainable. So it was definitely on the table, and there are many who are not surprised. Yes? To implement the ideas in the plan, where are the financial resources going to come from? Uh, there are a couple so far. Uh, you may have seen a few weeks ago there was a big announcement by the federal government. There were a couple of uh, federal secretaries here from HUD and Transportation, etc., uh, that re pledged monies that had already been on the books for Detroit uh, in different ways. So there was a reallocation of existing federal dollars to deploy in ways that would address some of the more urgent issues of the plan. So that's one. Um, upon an announcement of the plan in January, the Kresge Foundation put on the table an additional $150 million towards implementation. And so the implementation agency that was just put in place is now trying to figure out how to begin to deploy those resources. Uh, they're also trying to galvanize additional resources from philanthropy. And then the harder thing to quantify is the way in which uh, the private sector is investing. And a lot of that is really seen in what's going on. The private sector being business as well as uh, some institutions. Um, and a lot of that is probably most visible today, if you want to see change, is to go into downtown and midtown Detroit. Yes? Um, you mentioned that the plan was being approved by the city officially official plan? Yeah, the question was, is the plan being approved by the official plan? Um, the, I, the, the, the plan of the plan <laughs> was that uh, all or parts of it should be adopted through different means. So right now, what they're looking to do is revise the zoning and land use map. Uh, when we started, they had just approved their master plan of policies. Now, they had spent seven years working on it, and it just got approved in 2009. So they didn't really have an appetite to make this that. But we um, designed it and aligned it in such a way that if they wanted to stick with the sort of municipal template of the master plan of policies, that these recommendations could flow right into them. So the first order of business is the zoning and uh, the future land use map. Um, the Economic Growth Corporation and other like-minded agencies are adopting different policies from the plan. Um, DGC is adopting it as their strategic plan. Uh, different land agencies like land bank authorities and so forth have adopted all of the policies from our public land chapter as the way with which they're going to practice in a coordinated way. Um, the new city charter requires that the city have a sustainability plan and so we've been advocating that they uplift this into that format and make it so. Um, so we didn't want it to be an all or nothing proposition. We were thoughtful and there's a piece in the plan that describes the different vehicles by which parts of this work can be formally adopted. And we believe it's very important that it, it do so. The one good thing that Mayor Bing always said was that this work and this plan lives beyond his administration. And he was very sincere about that because obviously this stuff is going to take a long time. And it was very, and it made it even more important that so much of the broader community across those different sectors uh, participate in it, because each of them have a, a role and responsibility in taking it on over the next several decades. I was 
was taken by your uh, slide where the, the infrastructure was made for 1.8 million and then 700,000. Was there any plan about how to go in and start turning off parts of it? Or yeah, so there was a map that I blazed through really quick that had these shades of kind of purple. So that's basically the first pass at a reconfiguration mapping, which aligns with um, where you would do upgrades and renewals, where you would maintain, where you would renew and maintain, where you would downgrade, and where you do emergency repair only. So the idea is that over time, in certain increments of capital budgeting, there would be ways with which the system would be recalibrated. So in some of those cases, obviously, you are uh, just reducing capacities within existing infrastructures. In other cases, you are creating a new infrastructure system, uh, perhaps transitioning from um, gray infrastructure to green or blue. And in other cases, you may be upgrading the traditional system. So the idea is to work with those operating agencies to actually figure out how to do that over time. And this is where the kind of emergency manager and the bankruptcy uh, <coughs> might be opportunistic in that it's essential coming out of that uh, that they have a new plan of operating the city within the new limitations of or revenues and sources. And so we hope that this can be a guide towards how they might move to those kinds of more efficient and affordable systems. Ongoing work with them after the um, I'm doing a little bit of advising. The question was, am I doing ongoing work? I'm doing some advising to them as they're looking at implementation strategies. So, who in this room wants to go into public sector planning? Wow, nobody. <laughs> Is this a planning group? Nobody wants to go. What do you guys want to do? Real estate development. Just shout it out, you don't have to raise your name. <laughs> what do you want to do? Real estate, probably. Real estate. I'm going to start calling them people. I have a mobile mic. Environmental. Environmental. <laughs> public or private? Okay, see, so there's one public. You know. What do you want to do? Want to own it and be 18? And you're in a planning program? How's that working out? <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about you over here? What are you going to do? Any of you? What would you like to where Where would you like to work after college? Going back to my country and get a job. Find a job. Okay. How about you, sir? Um, not quite sure yet. Teaching. Teaching. <laughs> Public sector. Oh, so I said public sector. Nobody raised your hand. Oh, you did. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't see. How about you? Public sector. Was we it are, me? I just couldn't see people's hands, or what? We are. <laughs> Was it like this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. 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 Ok
is to recognize that there are other parts of the city that are generating money. And how do we get you know, the Dan Gilberts and all of those kind of private sector guys that have these amazing assets in those parts of town to be the same kind of advocates for wanting to change their environment that the downtown folks do? So, so that's one part of it. And it was important that we shine a light on the fact that there are other assets in the city besides downtown. I think the other thing, and this is going to be the, more, the most challenging one, is how do you get people to get equally excited in investing in the neighborhoods around those other places, right? Yeah. Right. And so um, I, I think it it's a lot of what philanthropy is trying to do with the way in which it's putting its money on the table and really directing that in areas outside of the core of the city. So that's one way. I think the other way we've encouraged the connection between the downtown and the midtown. So let's say, you know, Dan Gilbert and others are buying all of this real estate in downtown Detroit. And there's these huge, amazing buildings in this ground floor retail. And I think he's, you know, he's a true kind of Detroiter. He really loves the city. And one of the things I've been observing and that I've heard that he's interested in is really filling those spaces in with local businesses, right? Kind of much like your campus. I haven't seen a chain, you know, very few chain stores around us when I walk around. I think that's a great strategy. So how do you get him to sort of reach out and find existing entrepreneurs that live in the neighborhoods or grow new entrepreneurs that live in the neighborhoods so that they actually is an economic connection between the neighborhoods and them, right? So as people do better because they have economic opportunity, and my thing with Detroit being such an entrepreneurial city is that it shouldn't just be trying to find jobs for people, it should be trying to breed entrepreneurs. Right, whether they're coming in from somewhere else. So the more people have ownership in the economy, I think the greater chance that they can have an impact on the physical environment. I think sadly, to your point though, it's going to take a lot longer. It's harder to see. Yeah, it's just like um, I was affordable actually check as well, so I can go to the bottom line to the worst parts of Detroit. And I guess three years of short time period. Mm -hmm. I just never really saw from day one to when I stopped doing it. Here, yeah. and really saw an improvement as I went. Yeah. And I guess for some of these like low skilled workers in the area, it's like unless it's more industrialized, I don't know how yeah. they can raise up. And part of the strategy, and it's, and it's hard to see because you know most people don't get out to most of the city, is that there actually is a, a rather robust community development sort of group of folks in the city that locally are having really small impacts. The challenge, I think, is how do we get those scaled up so they actually do have a little bit more impact. So it's the hardest part of the work to do. Yeah, I mean, I would see certain things like I'm, you know, like the poor and the government kind of smile those mm -hmm. things. Yeah, no. right. And so part of what we try to do is pick up some of those good ideas and say, well, how do you make them bigger? Or how can you do something similar to what this community did in the other part of town? Because a lot of times they didn't know that people on the other side of town were doing something really interesting that could help them. It's just sad because they're so small. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the question was, have we looked at the influence of immigrant communities and global investment? Uh, not um, specifically as we looked at any other place, but what we did observe, and there was a, a quick map that I showed, that there are pockets of the city where the only place population is growing is in these communities that are predominantly foreign born. And that what we found, and what we found in those is that they, they are in fact these little microcosms of just what I'm talking about. They're the microcosms of where there are locally owned businesses, that people shop in the neighborhood where they work. I mean, it's a real sort of tight community that's somewhat self-supportive, right? So how do you, um, how do you apply that model to other places? And so uh, they're vibrant in, in really interesting ways. The street life is really vibrant. They tend to be the densest parts of the city, you know, that you might have lots of families living in a single building. Um, and these are areas in the map um, that we really lifted up as places of vibrancy um, and models of a certain kind of density that we thought could work. I think one of the things we wanted to look at there is different housing type. So for example, there's this trend uh, that a, a, a design group before called blotting. It's not a trend. It's, it's, it's a, a planning proposition, which says instead of the subdivision, let's just take a 50 by 100 foot lot 
and the building and zoning code requires that only one building can exist on that for one family. So blotting suggests that in these neighborhoods where you have that one house, but there are two blocks, there are two blocks next to it that are vacant, you know, could you re-subdivide that into one, but still put multiple houses on it? Exactly for this example, right? Just to pick, you know, use certain immigrant populations as an example where multiple family members come over, multiple generations. But everyone can have a house on the same lot that they all own together. You can't do that today legally. But wouldn't that be an interesting way to kind of replant certain neighborhoods and bring back a level of vibrancy to a community that doesn't have it? So it's this kind of innovation that I think is really on the table for you guys. It's going to be out there for you guys to kind of dive into if you're interested in doing any kind of urban planning work, regardless of where you are. It's a really interesting moment in time for innovation and creative creative thinking, which I think is kind of cool. And it's kind of, you know, strangely what attracts me to these really tough places, because I think these are the places where new stuff should happen and could happen. Would you talk a little bit about the role of anchor institutions? I'm thinking uh, Cleveland's University Circle, mm -hmm. and I think they're trying to do some of the similar things yeah. in the Woodward Corridor. Um, the question was about anchor institutions. Well, that's exactly what's happening in Midtown Detroit, right? And so there's a whole, uh, there's a Midtown Detroit organization <coughs> Uh, that has for several years been working with what's called the Anchor Institution. So the Anchor Institution is the hospital, Henry Ford Hospital, Detroit Hospital, it's Wayne State University, you guys have a building down in, in Midtown, it's the cultural institutions, the Art Institute, it's the library, it's the African American Center. So all of these guys are major employers and they're major landowners and they want to make the environment for their workers and visitors nice and wonderful. These people have to go eat lunch every day, they may run errands where they have to shop, and actually some of them may like to not commute from the suburbs and live where they live. So there is a trend uh, around the country, and lots of cities have done very well at recognizing that you can do neighborhood revitalization by thinking about how to capitalize on the presence of an anchor and the fact that they have workers, workers need housing, workers need retail, visitors need retail. All of these things can sort of spill out into creating other types of investment in a community. And so Cleveland is one example, West Philadelphia around the University of Pennsylvania is another example, uh, University of Chicago, the University of Illinois at Chicago is another example where they've taken, you know, these have been campuses that have otherwise been sitting in pretty depressed neighborhoods around them and through their, their real intentional investments of acquiring land, building certain amenities, um, have brought back uh, a community. And that's exactly what's happening in downtown Detroit right now. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about regional planning? Because we never have had it. The regional transit authority just got right. passed. But it seems to be there's such a disjunction between what's happening in the city of Detroit and then like SEMCOG, who decides they want to have to expand to 94, and it, whoa, are these plans like from 1950? <laughs> like, and Oakland County versus Wayne County, where do you see, uh, let's put it in positive, opportunity. Am I still on tape? Okay, this way. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, my observation uh, is that uh, this region does not have a really clear urban agenda. I, I guess that's pretty obvious if you look at it. So I'm not saying anything particularly profound, although it is a little controversial to say it, right? Um, and I think that a lot of the challenge of Detroit that is, some of which is becoming the challenge of the region, is because of the lack of that agenda. Right? It is pretty much allowed urban sprawl to happen pretty indiscriminately, right? Uh, the way in which federal funding appropriations come down and many, you know, regional planning organizations um, have a majority or, 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 or a strong primary role in the distribution of federal dollars, particularly transportation dollars, right? So their agendas tend to be heavily slanted towards those resources. Um, and they walk a pretty fine line in being sometimes very quite neutral to the constituents of a region. So I think that there have to be opportunities to look at regional agendas and regional planning outside of maybe 
the framework of that formal institution. And perhaps they need to be um, issue-based, right? And so the positive example of the Regional Transportation Authority is perhaps a good example of that. So how can this region now leverage the fact that it has this authority and do some smarter planning? Right? And, and who has to be at the table or who should be at the table of leading that. Um, I think that um, as the, the region is looking at its economic growth strategy uh, and recognizing where the assets are, perhaps that's another way to go. I think that's tougher, obviously, because there's so much regional competition. There's 21 employment districts in the region. And Detroit is third. So uh, that's going to be a tougher one. Um, perhaps there's an opportunity around environmental and infrastructure systems uh, to do that. And I think, you know, and I think this is a bigger question, and it's the thing that I'm interested in intellectually as a part of my work as an academic, as well as practice, is this issue of urban justice. You know, when do we actually really think about a planning framework that that seeks to alter the spatial injustice of our society and how we live, right? The fact that this region is so racially segregated. The fact that this region is so segregated by income, right? The fact that many people can go their whole lives and not interact with people from that other group and what that means in terms of what we care about. And it has a spatial implication for sure, because it stems from policies that we create that enable it to happen. So, you know, I would like to see, and I think that this region is a prime candidate for trying to put that a little front and center in some of the work it does, if it's bothered by the condition. So we'll see. I mean, it's why you have the big donut in the hole with Detroit. And Detroit is not just Detroit's problem, it's the region's problem. And if you don't believe it, just wait another 10 years. <laughs> And people will find out a little bit more acutely in their own homes, I think. So um, this isn't the only region that struggles with that kind of dynamic. It's pretty difficult all around. But it's interesting, um, you know, by, just by a quick way of example, um, the, the, the region uh, around uh, Cleveland, Youngstown, another kind of shrinking city kind of region, has actually been slightly more successful at uh, forging regional conversations with regional planning. They're actually in the process right now of doing a 21 county regional plan. And this is coming from the, um, I can't remember which grant they got. Uh, it was either a Living Cities grant or a Strong Communities grant. Uh, and they used it for that very purpose. Uh, they say it's really difficult, uh, but that I commend them that they're actually doing it. And they're doing it outside of the platform of the formal um, Regional municipal council structure. So. Any last questions from students? Anything you're curious about? It doesn't even have to be about Detroit. Time to go. <laughs> Does it have to be student? <laughs> no, I just, I just, you know, I see pain in faces. Like, when can we go? <laughs> so, I recognize that look. What can educational institutions, especially universities in the state, and we are a, we are the state university. What can state what universities can do, do for what, to what? What can we do to attract more minority, or how can we help the population get a better education uh, The question was, what can state uh, education institutions do to uh, attract more diversity and encourage more people to go to school? I mean, I don't know, that's a pretty broad question, kind of outside my pay grade, I think. Um, my speculation about it um, is, I don't think not just a responsibility of state institutions, uh, but a larger question about education reform at K-12. I say that, to, so here's an example, maybe that gets at your, doesn't really get your question, but it's an example nonetheless. So I'm a, I'm a licensed architect, and there are 105 licensed architects in the United States, 105,000, 
licensed architects in the United States, sorry, not 105,000. 105, uh, I'm one of only 279 black women, of that 105,000. Uh, there are 1,800 African American licensed architects out of 105,000, and 3,900 Hispanics. Of the 27,000 students uh, enrolled in architecture schools, both graduate and undergrad, uh, 1,300 are black. Uh, another 3,900 of them are Hispanic. And of that 1,300 who are black, 508 of them are in historically black colleges. So the majority of them are less, just over the majority of them are in uh, schools like this. Um, so I, I say that to use as an example, just to kind of stick within our own field, and I, I would imagine that the statistics around planning and landscape are equally um, depressing. Are interested in diversity. Uh, and I think you should be interested in diversity because a lot of you will be working in places that are. And so when we think about what we want them to be, should not, they not be informed and shaped and decisions be made by people that reflect the diversity of populations? Because we all come from different backgrounds, we all have different standards and cultures, and there is certainly a predominant culture, but Perhaps getting at that urban justice issue requires us to change the paradigm on what our standards are, and to change the paradigm on what the standards are, meaning more people, a more inclusive decision table. Right? That's how the, the standards get changed. Um, so for me, within our, my discipline and with my center, I have this uh, agenda that it's important that I figure out how to raise the awareness among youth of color of what architects and designers and planners and landscape architects do. So perhaps it just gets into their head that it's a choice that they have for themselves. And I think for a lot of disciplines outside of the standard ones, you know, no one's exposing young people in major cities to their options. And I'm not saying college is for anyone, which is why I'm really big on entrepreneurship. Because I think, and you know, it's certainly prevalent in this culture, that you can start businesses at the drop of a hat. You know, maybe the first one's not successful, but most successful entrepreneurs try and fail several times before they're really successful. Um, so there's something about raising the awareness among young people around the diversity of options of ownership and entrepreneurism and different types of disciplines that are out in the world that I think is really key. So can you know state colleges and universities be more engaged at the K through 12 level to help? expose that to, to young people in cities, perhaps that's one option, and I know you probably do some of that already, but perhaps that's one way to look at it. Any other questions? Yep. Um, so the idea of having a neighborhood school, so everyone in one neighborhood goes to one school, how do you think that's going to affect their exposure to, to diversity? Because as you see from the maps, there's a lot of clumping of cultures yeah. and races. Um, I know I'm from West Michigan, and I went to a predominantly white school just because that was how yeah. it was zoned. Yeah. And it became a problem um, for me later on. Mm -hmm. And for people I went to school with, because it's very difficult. Even when you write a college essay, they ask you what kind of diversity were you exposed to. <laughs> You're like, uh, <laughs> well, I was the same way, the exact opposite, yeah. right? So, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of different, than that, and I think there's no one answer, right? And so for different communities, I think you would have to weigh kind of the cost-benefit, if you will, of is diversity more important or is neighborhood stabilization kind of more important, right? And you know, it's a toss-up depending on where you are, and it's hard to make the call of which one is more important. Some communities, uh, that diversity might be, you know, there, there may be enough neighborhood stability, if you will, that diversity is where they need to go next. Whereas in some neighborhoods, the stability of community and neighborhood fabric is so broken that somehow if we could build stability around, and, and, and this is just one example, where education is the catalyst. You know, youth education is the catalyst to bring communities together that will spill over and have an impact on community, social life, and physical environment. Perhaps that's more the priority over, okay, there are only brown kids at this school, though. 
So I think it, you have to look at each of these situations very specifically in the context that they're in and make those kind of calls. But you raise a very good kind of question or observation about you know the trade-off that sometimes these decisions have, and they're all going to have them. You know, no solution is going to solve everything. You really have to look very critically at the context you're in and make the best decision for that time and place. All right. I think you've been really <laughs> Thank you all for a really Thank good question. <laughs>